your first drag race, you say, how can anything be louder than that? Stand back. It's coming. They've got a little more clutch, a little more power now. Both of them hooking up hard. Got on the thing. Yeah, the crowd's got on the thing. Ripped her out. So that's a little flat for it. Well, we're in the program, I think. 6.15. I think, I think so. I think so. Huh? I run it. You know, it's about a mile an hour. She was traveling pretty fast. You know, I run her through the lights. I, I didn't mean to do that. She was what kind of mile an hour? Did anybody hear? I don't know. I don't know. It had to be pretty good, though. You know, that's something just because, you know, the same time before? Yeah. So you know when that thing started to shake before, you know? The thing started just almost on the verge, and it just it straightened out. It just, just started to shake now. I know. I got a two. Tire coming through. Oh, James, on again. Oh, no. You lost another one? Look at this thing. Filter, car bottle? Oh, I popped off by accident. Okay, that's all right. It costs too much, man. I'm saying 80 bucks every time. That's not the one I had a bad valve this morning, is it? No. <laughs> have to go on the starting line. 615, I don't know what the hell it was. I couldn't believe it. Huh? 615, you just got a new track record? Track record was 618. Is that right? Yes. Well, I was here. Uh, uh, I didn't hear it. Are we here or what? Put that Howard decal on there, Doc. Wait a minute, put that Howard decal on there. Boy, she was smoking a little bit, though.
drag racing, of course, has uh, evolved from racing right on the streets. Uh, that's where it all began with, you know, a bunch of kids that get together and block off a street or do whatever they had to do to race their cars from a standing start as far as they, they would run. Traditionally, the distance was a quarter mile, 1,320 feet. And from that evolved the things that we're doing today, which are acceleration tests and the standing start. Naturally, we're much more sophisticated now than we were 10 years ago in that we have electronic timing devices that time the cars are within a thousandth of a second. We have side-by-side -side heads up racing by cars that cost as much as thirty and forty thousand dollars to build from the days when they were running a quarter mile at eleven seconds. We've now got cars running a quarter mile five and a half seconds at speeds over two hundred and fifty miles an hour. Scientists and engineers never thought that it would get this far. They predicted in 1956 that a man could not withstand the g-forces on his body well here we are going 100 miles an hour faster than that half the time they said it would happen where we're going to go i guess nobody knows uh Ralph Nader and the ecologists don't put us right away, I'd say we'll probably see a four-second run somewhere. Yeah. Well, I think it's, uh, it's one of the largest spectator sports in the world right now, and I think it's getting bigger. The only thing that we're fighting right now is the noise end of it. When you take an engine like mine that puts out in the area of 2,000 horsepower, and the noise is about the same as a jet taking off, People around get tired of hearing it, and uh, it seems to be hurting the sport a little bit. Lions Drag Strip, they had to close down because of the noise. When we called them funny cars originally, I don't think we ever dreamed that they'd get to the popularity they are now. The fact of the matter is, a funny car is really a dragster with a fiberglass body on it. It's a replica of a street car. I mean, it looks very much like a Chevrolet Monza or a Mustang II or whatever except for the fact that it weighs about 1,750 pounds and has an explosive motor in it that's capable of pushing the car to speeds of, well, Don Perdomo's national record at 240 miles an hour at 597. It's uh, absolutely phenomenal. And as far as kids go, funny cars are the accepted thing. First funny cars first originated about 1965, and they were funny looking cars, and this is the reason the name got tagged on them. Needless to say, a car like this, there's really nothing funny about it. high school auto shop in uh, Cerritos and this car I did build myself in my garage with a little bit of help with some of my friends but I get no actual cash from anybody all the money that goes in this car comes out of my paycheck to be competitive in the double-a fuel funny car ranks you better have at least a hundred thousand dollars going in because it's going to cost you that much and if you really want to be competitive and try and run with Perdome around the country and go on tour Without any sponsors at all, you probably better look at it with close to $200,000. So it's no cheap matter. It's cheaper for somebody. People come and say, I'd rather own a funny car. I say, well, easier to go to the Indianapolis 500. That's a much easier thing to qualify for, much easier thing to get in, a lot less than trying to run a funny car around the country. 156.79. Ron Ely, the It's a cruel way to look at it, but that's the way it turns out. When you're running as good as the best of them, then it's going to take its toll on parts. And then it comes right back down to, can you afford to keep replacing the parts that stay there? So therefore, you either run it at maximum, 
or you back off a little bit and try to preserve your forest. And if you start backing off to preserve your forest, then you're not going to perform as well. Money. Money. You've got some guys that have been in it for 15, 18 years that are always there, and these other guys come in and come out. They go, it's due to their what they can afford they do. Very expensive. Very few people may actually net any money. The bottom line in drag racing is very most it's a very high dollar sport, about what it amounts to. And very few guys actually net any money off it. Burnout's the most necessary ritual. In funny car racing, sure, they're fun to watch. Tires smoke screaming from the windows of these cars, but it really is not fan time at all. It's very necessary to put some fresh, sticky rubber down on the pavement, to heat up the tires, and the crewmen play a very important part in bringing these drivers back into those tracks. My total investment of racing cars will gross between three and four hundred thousand dollars a year. It's just like a gunfighter. The way to build your reputation is to beat the big names or win win some big races. For the guy that's there that's who is favored, the promoter expects him to do well, so he's got to be right there all the time. Can't take any chances. You know, all these other guys, if they beat him and blow their car up, they could care less because they'll go home, but they also put that guy out. You know, to stay in the top half a dozen cars, I think is plenty tough because there's so many people out there, you know. But I've seen a lot of them come and a lot of them go, and the money, of course, I think is the big factor. I like the competition, I like the racing, I like the big races. I like racing the guys that are tough, the ones you don't think you can beat. Unbeaten in one full year of NHRA competition. Went to the starting line all over this country. The NHRA Winston Major events 31 times he left that starting line, never to be defeated. The brand new national record holder at 597, 240, the winningest driver in the history of drag racing. Welcome the snake, Don Perdome, to Fremont Raceway. <laughs> McEwen had an awfully good year. He, uh, uh, we had several, several match races, and uh, he beat the majority of them. Uh, but in the last couple of years, he's been off. So when a guy's off, on, you know, like two years in a row, uh, naturally, uh, someone's going to say he's a pushover or something like that. But he, he tries awfully hard, and at any given time, he can beat you. We used to be very good buddies, close friends, and we raced, okay? Then I 
got a deal, an idea to start really getting into the sponsor deal. I was kind of the first one to really get into the money sponsors, the yeah. hustle of sponsors. Yeah. And uh, I knew some people at Mattel. So I set that deal up and went to Perdome and I said, uh, it seems to me that the mongoose snake thing would be a natural deal with the kids. Let's go to Mattel and see if we can put a package together and sell it. And if I do it, are you interested? He said, yeah. But he said, you will never get any money. And we went in there and put together a nice three-year package with them. Got a corporation, Wildlife Racing Enterprises, raced as a team for three years. And, uh, and it just got to the point where I couldn't, uh, couldn't get along. The guy that I was driving for was very big on nicknames and things. And he says, uh, he says this is just like the mongoose and the snake in Ripley's uh, Jungle Book. So that's, uh, we went and looked up the shit, and that's about the world's ugliest animals, a mongoose, even related to a mink, ferret, weasel family, see? A lot of kids have grown up with us the last three or four years, followed us into the monogram and Ravel model kits with our pictures on. Well, this particular car here is, is a Ravel uh, 125th model of the funny car, and uh, so this is the same in the dragster. Did you make it yourself? No, I had a kid across the street make them. It's it's not. They're they're so complex. They have uh, actual have spark plug wire and uh, every detail. Kids uh, kids want them to be very right down to it, you know, on the thing. And if it's not, they'll write the company letters and say that isn't really the way their car is and stuff. They're it's a very big selling thing in the country. They sold a lot of those, millions of them. There's a lot of things going on, and drag racing still has never broke into heavy into the newspapers. The drag racing fans are hardcore, you know. You run the TV and radio advertisements, and they come out and watch. Like I never pushed before 
of the chassis are uh, aircraft alloy steel, it's 4130. It's a high strength material that you can use because of its light weight. These cars here, uh, in the chassis alone, there's about 160 hours in it. The base price of our cars start off at $3,800, and then it can go anywhere on up to $15,000, depending on how much of a car he wants. The shells are made from the original cars, and the wheel wells have been moved around to accommodate the different wheelbases uh, of the chassis manufacturers. And uh, aerodynamics have been set into the body so they can gain their best advantage for a mile per hour. We take a body and rework it, and that becomes a plug. Then we take the mold off the plug. It's a split mold, and it's a one-piece body. In order to get the body out, then you have to start unfolding all these flanges and start pulling the mold apart a piece at a time. We're really interested in weight. And this is how you get lightweight bodies. Did you do the Blue Max? Blue Max, yes. It's been highly modified. Probably one of the tougher ones we've had to do to adapt to racing. We spent, I'd say, seven weeks of many, many hours, probably 16 hours a day to get that car ready. Painting funny cars is like commercial art. You know, that's a Foster and Kleiser sign, but to me it's a work of art. When painting first started, when painting these cars first started, more or less it was left up to the painters. A guy would come in and go, what looks good on my car? Uh, can you design something, make it different, multicolored type situation? Now, drag racing has got so professionalized, the sponsors have gotten uh, to the point to where they have pre-prepared artwork, and all the painter job now is a matter of duplicating the pre-prepared artwork, putting it into uh, real life. The general, the general cost of a paint job from the ground up is around $750. Uh, by the time they're lettered and everything, probably run out about 12 and a half. The exterior paint is either one, acrylic enamel or polyurethane, or two, acrylic lacquer, which is most of your trick paints are done in acrylic lacquer. Well, uh, yeah, trick paint job, that's kind of a, uh, uh, you know, you can take it many ways. My definition of trick paint is exactly what you see here. These two cars are... Uh, Pearl-based cars with candy overlays, a lot of shading. In other words, you notice this yellow shades into a real hot orange. The blue shades into a dark blue. And it's a multicolored situation is what we have there. And that's what I would term trick paint. racing is like a needle. <laughs> I mean, when it's under your skin, it's hard to get out. Did you ever drive a car like this? Never. Well, you've only been on the, the building, built. Well, I build them because uh, I love the cars myself. I love drag racing. Uh, I used to drive race cars before, but nothing quite like this. And um, I can't afford to race one of these, so you know, I, I get it all out by building it. <laughs> one thing about drag racing is the only automotive sport that lets the spectator into the pits, and uh, drag racing is a, is a good sport for an ego trip because you've got your fans facing you, telling you right in your face, and you know how he looks like, and he's telling you you're great. When you're driving a NASCAR race car around a track, you know, you never see the spectator, and you hear them clapping and cheering, but you never know who they are, you know, and drag racing, you get to meet your fans, and uh, the more fans you meet, you know, your ego gets just pumped up. The 
people want to see me more than the car. I can drive a dragster, a funny car, a pro stocker, or what have you, but it's Tommy Ivo that they're more interested in. So therefore, I have got to be with the car and driving it. Without me there, the car falls dead. Well, it started out with the Mickey Mouse Club years and years ago, you know, one of the Musketeers, and went on to the Bachelor Father, Donna Reed, uh, Margie, and so forth and so on. I was at that for about 28 years. Here comes the guy that 15 years ago got his start in the Mind of the Marcy show. TV Tommy Ivo. Looks his occupation is drag racer and actor. Whenever anyone asks me my occupation, I'll say I'm a race car driver instead of a drag racing driver because they've still unfortunately got the stigma of the mud flaps and drag racing with some people holds a very high echelon, you know, but unfortunately not enough of them. the car started aving and he was sideways and shit. I was looking at the tree and it had the thing all shrouded off. And I was looking at the rock. <laughs> I was trying to, what the hell is the light? <laughs> Chacha's enjoying a uh, flourish now because she's a chick, you know. And chicks want to be garbage collectors and jail guards and everything else. So whenever a chick does anything and does well at it, as she has, naturally the media picks it up just like that. I think Chacha does a very good job. I, I, you know, she's a woman driver. I don't think that makes any difference. She's very good on the starting line. and. Uh, she seems to handle the car all right. She'd been in a, she was in a couple of fires with her funny car. You know, she does all right. So of course, with the lim woman's lib thing and everything being a big deal, it was a real easy thing for her to get a lot of publicity last year. Everybody picked her right up on that because of the, you know, the Chris Everett, the Billie Jean King, and the first woman senator and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, that's okay. I, if I had to race her, I'd race her like anybody else, you know? All you ladies, pay attention because cha-cha Shirley Mulvalley won top four, also ran 253 miles an hour through the quarter mile at Orange County International Raceways. That's right, the lady did it.
like $150,000 a year just to maintain this one car. They're making a fortune. Well, you've seen Pink's place. You've seen his flow bench, his supercharger motors thing. That cost a lot of money, that stuff he had made. And uh, he is the highest priced engine builder in the country, but I think he does the best work. Over the years, uh, I would say that all of the, the top funny cars were running our engines. And when I say top cars, I mean the ones that set the lowest ETs or top speeds or win the majority of the races or set the records. If I come in here, I'm the customer. I want a complete top fuel engine, the best. You're looking at about $11,000 okay. for a complete. That's aluminum block and aluminum heads and all the latest parts that are available. Do some people have more than one? Well, yes. Uh, if you're going to be competitive and you want to race and make money, uh, you have to have more than one. You need to have minimum of two, possibly three. Double check everything. Make sure the mains are all okay. Yeah, I've done the mains. Okay. Let me just go over them again. Here, you want to go over them again? This engine here produces approximately 2,000 horsepower. It's built, designed, and equipped to run nitromethane, and it uses six and a half gallons of fuel on a run, a little over six second run. cylinder head and it invariably blows it out on the bottom and the oil comes out and it goes on the headers and the exhaust pipes on a supercharged fuel engine are almost cherry red you can almost see through them they're mm -hmm. so hot and when that oil gets on them and it's a instant fire When the cold fuel coming in and the pressure and the fire coming up meet, then you have the explosion and it blows the supercharger off of the engine. Now, he, that guy died, and he's dead, yeah. He didn't die in the racing, did he? Yeah. He did? Yeah, he, uh, he, uh, at Indianapolis a few years ago, they broke uh, something in the clutch, and one of the bolts came out and went through the, uh, oil pan, and the oil came out yeah. and got on the headers on the exhaust yeah. system. This is a front-engine dragster. Right and it caught fire, and there's nothing worse than an oil fire. A fuel fire, a fire is a fire, but an oil fire burns with intense heat. And the fire came back, and it burned its way right through the firewall. And the car's going down the track probably 220 miles an hour, and this flame is coming in under the cowling, you know, and, and it's just like a torch. Uh, they got him out of the uh, car, and he was still alive, and they got him to the hospital. But again, they didn't know that much about burns. You know, he had good fire suit and so forth, but they didn't have fire bottles in the dragster's end. Right. That man's name was a zookeeper. Right? Zookeeper, right. Yeah. John Mullen, a zookeeper, right.
We keep the, you know, the tracks clean. We have a truck uh, right past the lights. We have a truck at Dragster Station. Have you ever had to get a guy out of a car? This morning, a yeah. couple of times out in the field here today. All right through there. Caught that cyclone fencing and it wrapped it up pretty good. Yeah, wrap, yeah, they said it was kind of wrapped around the yeah, car. Wrapped around the tire, wrapped around the whole thing. And they might hit a slippery spot and then hook up again. And that's what'll flip them. And that's what just happened to that one that the uh, mm. one that flipped right down here at the guardrail. <laughs> Doug, he was pretty lucky. He only got a broken arm out of that. His car broke in two pieces. Mm. Uh, other than that, everybody else has walked away today. Okay. I've had some close calls, but luckily I haven't been hurt. But I think everybody Everybody has been has been in the same situation. There's always a close call. So you just can't say how close they are or what would have happened. What about the danger back uh, it's, no, it's no more than anything else. Yeah. Like getting up in the morning. Are you worried about the danger? Getting no. yourself killed out there? No. Do you ever worry about any of these guys? No, that's what they want to do. It's just, it's just very hard to explain what it's like. It's, it's the scariest thing that ever happened to me. I got uh, burns on my hands. That was it. Now, how about him? Uh, he had a broken leg. Does it, a crash like that make you worry? You know, like like today, are you worried about having to go out there and do sure, that but type of thing? That I was again? just, yeah, right. I was just as worried about it, you know, before it happened as I am now. You know, I knew my chances when I get in this thing, and you know, I know them now too. Well, I like to build cars with bodies that have a wide enough opening so the driver can get out. Uh, there's been one instance where a driver was in a bad fire and there wasn't any way he could get out of that car. people can get their horsepower to be so the cars have a tendency to wheel stand so now it's a big trip ballasting the car up front so that it keeps the car down and yet still have enough weight where you can have the car launch off of the line initially
a sport, but they're doing their best to turn it into show business. It's unfortunate, but true, because show, show business makes more money than sports do. Do you understand what I mean? people feel this is more of show business than an actual sport. What do you feel about that? Yeah, that's unfortunate that uh, some people think that way uh, because I sure don't. It's, uh, it's really a sport. It's a professional thing. It's uh, something that uh, I take very seriously. Well, first I guess I was inspired by the movie Patton. I saw the movie Patton, and uh, I thought at that time it'd be a good idea to build an exhibition vehicle in response to a tank. When he was in Germany, I guess the tank was the main weapon that was used, and uh, it was really had a legend followed after that time, and uh, that inspired me to build a tank. Uh, we're sponsored by the United States Army. No, I'm a civilian. Well, they have chose to buy an ad on the side of it in goodwill to the youth in general that uh, the new voluntary army is, uh, is just like it looks. In other words, it's whatever the individual would like to make of himself. Well, it gives us the opportunity to uh, talk to the kids. Uh, this is a real uh, good tie-in at a particular age group that we're trying to address. The 18-year-old uh, high school student, uh, he's interested in drag racing. That's why the Army's interested in drag racing. One tells fire and one tell on wheels. One's a tank, one's a self-propelled howitzer. That's all magnesium. That's really lightweight. That gun weighs approximately 11 pounds. I guess they call it one of their most sacred pieces because it'll put a shell like 18-mile range in a three-foot square. These two wheel-standing tanks are the most unbelievable things in the world. Both of them run over 120 miles an hour on the rear wheel. Both of them running blown nitromethane burning engines. They're going to make two runs for you to make up for being late. You can actually see better when the car is in the air than you can when it's down on the ground. And the car actually handles better on two wheels than it does four. Most people don't think it'll run on two wheels. Most people think it looks neat, but what do you do with it? The uh, concept has been 100%. I've only had one hassle in uh, four years, and that was with a Baptist minister in Tennessee. He said the word hell was contributing to the youth today, and that was the problem with the country, that people had no respect, and it was to be put in the Bible, and in a non-mention type place. Well, I think there's two types of drag racing. I think there's the individual that uh, drag races on the street, and then there's the individual that drag races in competition out of the track. 
I'd classify them uh, kind of under a, uh, two different elements. I think it's a different crowd, really. I think the people that the police are addressing are not the same folks we're dealing with out here. Well, there are, there are monetary, uh, monetary considerations that are conducted with our headquarters and uh, and on the snake, uh, but as far as we're concerned, really, it's a, it's a goodwill gesture between the two of us. It's today. Drag racing is today. It's, it's something that's happening now, and uh, the Army is utilizing that, that uh, form of communication to, to communicate with, uh, with the kids, right? right. To, uh, to create a link there somewhere. How it works is money. I mean, it's that simple. In other words, Donnie Perdome doesn't have the U.S. Army on the side of his car for a low-dollar deal. I mean, they put up money, and he's, he's selling he's a billboard for the Army is what it amounts to. And I've been doing it for 18 years, and when I don't go racing on a weekend now, it's not as bad as it used to be. I used to think that, that if you, there wasn't a drag race on the weekend, that everything was closed. I didn't know there were other things to do. Here. He's resting today so he can hustle girls. That's right. Tonight. That's yeah. right. I'm going to do you a favor. Years ago when I first started on tour, I had a station wagon, an old dragster, and we went back east. Then we, we went on into the bigger, better things, and we ended up with a big truck with the car on the back and then into the funny car business. Now I don't like to ride with them at all. I, I don't like to ride with them from my house to Orange County, which is eight minutes. I'd rather just meet them there. When I'm on tour from April to September, I like to fly. And of course, the expenses are high that way, but that's the way I enjoy doing it now. To a point, it's a, like an uh, entertainment circus thing. When you start putting the jet dragsters and the wheel standers, and you have the Navy parachute team come in, they're trying to give the people so many different things now to get them out there to spend their money. It's getting so tough to draw the people for a show that you've got to give them more than just a flat. See, a flat drag race, is good, but God only lasts six seconds. Well, Doug Rose, of course, drives a green Mamba jet car, jet dragsters. Uh, they're very heavy and sometimes cumbersome to awfully hard to stop, even with the parachutes they have. Uh, Rose doesn't have any legs. He'll tell you how safe the cars are all the time and how there's no problem with them. At the same time, he's been a victim of some of the worst accidents in the history of jet dragsters. They're very spectacular. Rose is an excellent driver. They don't go near as fast as the rocket cars because they are so heavy, but uh, there's something to see. So we need all of you spectators to find a seat, get out of that area, uh, because these fences could weaken and fall over from the thrust of these great jets. Naturally, it just figures, if you think about it, you don't want to be behind uh, a jet car when he turns the afterburner on. Now, these are J46 and a, a J34 jet engine. Uh, for some of you uh, old guys that maybe flew during the Korean War, uh, one was in a Navy Banshee, the other one in a trainer. Doug Rose is possibly the fastest jet driver in the world today. Stephanie Rose, well, she loves this car, I'll tell you. She goes out there and she not only polishes the car, she polishes all the rotor blades in it and the stator blades. She knows all about the inside of this car and uh, she treats it with loving care. Now, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. When these cars come up to the starting line, they will come up there with almost 100%. Those engines will be spinning the tip speeds on these rotor blades at near sonic speed. And nobody should be crossing over behind the fence because it's just possible it could be blown over. Now, these guys wrap these engines up to 10,000 RPM. The tip speed on the blades are right at sonic, just under sonic. You will, in fact, it, it actually just blows your mind, the sound of it. Fire pouring out behind the green line.
and the valves trying to touch the business. Now that was a burnout that can't be stopped. I, I don't see how. I mean, he thundered the ground. I mean, hammered it. And took it all the way out to the eighth mile. Jungle Jim, believe it or not, makes it his home in Pennsylvania. This is the place he cut his teeth. He was uh, born here. He lived out here. And he's a professional ride racer. Oh, boy. Noise is hard to describe. Anybody that's never heard it? It's noise, but there's something delicious. Represents, I guess.
Apparently, I would guess, okay, you just want to guess, that they might have a crack in the fuel tank. That looks like fuel, doesn't it, Chad, out on the starting line? Nitro? I understand that we don't have serious injuries. We hope not. Well, here today at Fremont, of course, we've got, you talk about dangerous things. Everybody knows hang gliders are dangerous, and for sure motorcycles are dangerous, particularly motorcycles that jump over cars. Well, we've got a guy, uh, Bob Correll, who came to us at International Raceway Parks about four months ago and said, I've got a hang glider on a motorcycle, and I'm capable of jumping distances of, through, well, a distance of 50 cars if necessary. Well, of course, we giggled at that and didn't think that was really possible, and the guy, we made the guy come out and show us what he could do, and today he's going to perform here at Fremont Raceway. The world's record is listed in the Guinness Book of World's Records for jumping cars with a motorcycle. I happen to have certified as 22 cars by Bob Gill in Seattle, Washington, about four years ago. Well, Gill's completely paralyzed, as is just about everybody else that has tried this, this sport of jumping motorcycles. Completely well, paralyzed in a, in a bed, did you said? No, paralyzed in a wheelchair from the waist down. He tried to jump over a, uh, a lake and ran into the side of a cliff. And uh, I mean, it's a very dangerous thing. This is a dangerous thing. I mean, you got to see these guys to believe them. Uh, it scares me when I see, you know, just a look at it. Well, what, how does this affect you? It scares me every time. It scares me, but I, I love doing it something about it, the, 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 the limelight, the show business. The and if you're at all weak-kneed or faint of heart, you might as well go home now. He's doing about 70 miles an hour off the rim. Now, you figure a regular jumper would be doing about 100. But the thing is, is with that, even though he's slower, he's going to have different kind of problems. A puff of wind blow him right out of the track. If you notice the way it's constructed, he's got a cage around him. If he's thrown forward the way most bikes are, are throw their riders, he's going to break either his neck or his collarbone and then forward bar. If you catch him on either side, he's going to break a rib or his back. He's gone into a barbed wire fence once, and he's come down on the top of four cars once. Now, I've done it twice, but on the second jump, I just barely made it over the last truck. I've since rebuilt the engine on the motorcycle, so I hope that I'll be able to clear it better today. I wouldn't ride that thing down the drag strip. It's unbelievable. The guy's nuts, for sure. Well, his company name says it all. Balls Enterprises, Inc. Here he comes. Look at the smoke off the guy. He's up. He's up. He's flying. He was standing right there. Wouldn't it look like right next to the ramp there, Ted? Well, I'll tell you, I'm thoroughly impressed with it. You guys that have been standing head on like I was to him when he was coming directly to me, you should have seen him up in the air trying to correct that thing. It was unbelievable. And then all of a sudden, the air left it, and you saw instant drop. Too much. Just, just too much.
619. You know, do you think Lieberman, uh, that he has a 619, will he try to beat the 612? I mean, that is really asking a lot of anybody to run a better than a 612. In fact, I think only three cars in drag racing history might have run quicker than a 612. Still undefeated in NHRA competition this last September. 